The China Global South podcast is supported in part by the Africa China Reporting Project at Wits University in Johannesburg and by our subscribers. Thank you. If you'd like to subscribe for daily news and exclusive analysis about every aspect of China's engagement in Africa, Asia, and throughout the developing world, go to chinaglobalsouth.com forward slash subscribe. Hello and welcome to another edition of the China Global South podcast. I'm Eric Olander, and as always, I'm joined by China Global South's managing editor, Kobus van Staden, in Johannesburg, South Africa. A very good afternoon to you, Kobus. Good afternoon. Kobus, we are coming to the end of another COP. That is the big annual gathering of tens of thousands, I think even hundreds of thousands of environmental stakeholders, activists, NGOs, scholars, everybody got together in Dubai this year for 10 or 11 days to try and come together and find some solutions to the global climate crisis. I'm going to be up front with everybody. We're recording this right before the end, so we don't know what the final communique is going to say. We have an idea of what it's going to say, but we don't know. Our conversation today is going to be on the 10 days leading up to the final communique. So if you want to know what was said in the final communique, there's going to be coverage of it all over the place. We're specifically going to focus on the role of China and China's relationships in the Middle East and also some of the more contentious discussions that took place at this year's COP. Kobus, it was very interesting because I felt that compared to previous years, this was a much more honest discussion about climate change than we've seen in any other COP. So first of all, the African group of negotiators representing the African delegation, they came out and said that they were extremely frustrated over how the process was handled, where they were frustrated by the slow pace. They were frustrated by them being iced out of the conversations. Oftentimes they said that the decisions were being made behind closed doors among the wealthy countries and they weren't invited. They also expressed some anxiety that their negotiators were not as skilled and as knowledgeable as those from the wealthier countries. And so they just didn't understand all of the issues that were being presented to them. And they are going to potentially consider declaring COP a failure if they don't get some of the demands that they've been asking for. OPEC, the oil cartel, They too came out with a lot more honesty this time. OPEC Secretary General Hatim al Gais sent a letter to the group's 13 members and the 10 members of OPEC Plus after negotiators at talks in Dubai released a draft deal that included calls for a phase-out of fossil fuels. The Secretary General's letter called on its members to, quote, proactively reject any text or formula that targets energy, that is, fossil fuels, rather than emissions. So what they want to do is they want to capture pollution rather than cut down on the sales of oil, gas. And so, uh, again, a certain honesty we haven't seen before. And then, Kobus, I'd like to get your take on the China angle, which is something you've been covering, again, for the past 10 days since we started COP for our subscribers. And Xie Jinhua, who is the special envoy for climate change from China, He said, quote, I have participated in these climate negotiations for 16 years. This is the hardest meeting this year. There are so many issues to settle. He said there was little chance the summit could be called a success if countries could not agree to language on the future of fossil fuels. And Kobus, the real debate that's been happening right now is this debate over phase out or phase down. And that may seem like a subtle difference, but it's absolutely fundamental to the disagreements that have been taking place over the past 10 days in Dubai. Yeah, and this is where a lot of the resistance from OPEC also comes in. Now, obviously, a phase out is a plan to remove fossil fuels from the mix as much as one can, as soon as one can. A phase down is a much vaguer commitment towards changing the mix of energy sources without necessarily taking fossil fuels out of the mix completely. And of course, you know, that plus a focus on carbon capture rather than just eliminating emissions at source, the language overlays a a kind of a fight for survival from fossil fuel producing countries, particularly led by Saudi Arabia. And we've, we've seen also reports that Saudi Arabian delegates have been particularly crafty slash problematic slash 
smart depending on where you land on that debate in terms of just disrupting processes adding language that slows things down you know kind of stretching processes out and, and so on you know essentially kind of like operating somewhat as spoilers you know kind of within the process so you know uh, w- what we've seen from china is i think following china's discussions with the u.s just ahead of cop 28 um, in, in, in about mid-november the two of them seem to be a little bit more on the same page but china's positions have far been both somewhat encouraging, but at the same time also highly ambiguous. So we're still not 100% sure where China's landing on some of these key issues. China is obviously has a strong diplomatic relationship with Saudi Arabia. And also in that earlier COPs, we've seen both China and India, you know, suddenly pushing for weakened language right at the end of the process. So, you know, kind of it really is, you know, kind of it'll, one will only really be able to say what China's position has been in retrospect. Well, let's find out a little bit more about China's role at this year's COP. From someone who covered the China Pavilion in Dubai, Anika Patel is a China analyst at Carbon Brief, which is a news site focused on global climate issues. If you are, you know, you follow this for work and you follow these issues seriously, Carbon Brief is a must, must read. Anika, a very good morning to you. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. Eric Kobus, good morning, and thank you so much for that kind introduction. It's wonderful to have you on the show. Again, you were there for the first week covering the China Pavilion. China had one of the largest delegations at COP, which suits its role as both the second largest economy, the second largest country in the world, and the largest producer of climate emissions today. Tell us a little bit about the China presence at COP, and then we'll get into the details of some of the issues. Absolutely. I think you hit the nail right on the head there, just pointing to the scale of it, first of all. China had the joint third largest delegation, joint with Nigeria. I think they had just over 1,400 people at this COP. So that included high-level government ministers, that included press, that included scientists, key advisors on um, who are part of, you know, maybe not the official Chinese political body, but part of these constellation of consultative bodies that they have around them. And frankly, that just kind of fit into a COP that... I think most commentators would say is on a scale they've never seen. A lot of my colleagues were at Sharm el-Sheikh last year, at Glasgow the year before, and they were kind of blown away by the size of COP in general. And then looking at the China Pavilion, the size of the China delegation and the number of events that were going on simultaneously. I think it's frankly a lot to get your head around. It doesn't help as well that UN documents and, and UN websites are hard enough to navigate as it is. But frankly, my experience was that you can run around from pavilion to pavilion and there's always very interesting, very high level speakers talking about something that China will have an interest in. And how has China's position evolved since, you know, the previous COP and some of the gatherings before that? Yeah, that's an excellent question. I mean, to take that more long-term view, first of all, Kobus, I think China really was on the map in Copenhagen, which was many, many years ago now. But that was where, you know, you had had this kind of back and forth between countries on whether we should be going for two degrees or 1.5 degrees. And China was seen as a bit of a spoiler in those COPs. If you fast forward to COP26 at Glasgow, so that was two years ago, you suddenly have this this joint statement between the US and China, both recognized as the biggest emitters and the most consequential emitters, where you suddenly see, I think, or rather the global community suddenly sees China in a bit more of a nuanced view. So there's still, I think, this sense and this, this conflict in perspectives where some countries will still see China as the biggest emitter and part of the problem, whereas China and perhaps other developing nations, the global South nations, would see it as a provider of solutions. And you start seeing that tension, I think, a little bit more clearly at COP26. COP26 and COP27, though, I think were complicated as well, just by the fact that you had COVID. So particularly in Glasgow, I think there was a smaller delegation. There wasn't as much interplay between China or a Chinese delegation and other negotiators. Whereas if you look at COP28, frankly, you have negotiators everywhere. US climate envoy John Kerry and Chinese climate envoy Xia Jianhua in three-hour meetings, little huddles where they're trying to figure out good compromises. 
on you know issues like fossil fuels and then they're running to a methane summit and then they're running to a side event on the role of think tanks in china so you just have i think a lot more china's presence is there in terms of scale but then also just in terms of that opportunity to understand china's thinking and then also maybe to push back against certain narratives on a range of different topics well, let's go down that path. So China recoils at the idea that it is the villain in all of this because it says although China is the largest emitter of greenhouse gases, something that critics in the West, particularly the United States, like to point out a lot, on a per capita basis, China is considerably smaller. And in fact, I think the United States, the Gulf states, even Cobus, your countrymen <laughs> figure up there on the per capita basis are terrible when it comes to climate emissions. And so the Chinese really want to point out there's a big difference. The also the Chinese, like a lot of global South countries, will say that, listen, this problem started 100 years ago with industrialization in the West and in Japan and in the advanced economies. And we're now being blamed for what you did 100 years ago. So when it comes to these narratives, and this is important into understanding where these different countries are coming from, whether China is the victim or the villain really depends on where you stand and how you see China. How did you, as somebody who was trying to cover China and what their positions are, did you learn more about their position, even though there were so many people there? Or was this just them saying the same things over and over again and your knowledge now that you've left was really not much more than what you went in with it? That is a very good question. I'm going to give the academics answer. As always, I think it's a little bit of both. So speaking to people, especially, so I was on the ground in the first week in particular. And during that first week, you don't really get too much movement. Everyone's still kind of drawing out their battle lines and going in with their own high level suggestions or demands that then will get hammered out into a compromise. So if you look, for example, at Ding Xuexiang, who for listeners who don't know is executive vice premier in China, he's one of the seven leaders of the Politburo Standing Committee. So really one of the seven most powerful people in China, very close confidant of Xi, and then also is the leader who oversees the climate portfolio. His opening speech at the Leaders Summit, the World Climate Action Summit, right at the beginning of COP, didn't reveal too much at all. That very similar to what China's been saying about, look, we're a developing country on a per capita basis. Our emissions are still significant, but not to the level of developed nations. On the loss and damage fund, you know, that's still something that we should have access to. I think as negotiations develop, that's when you start seeing those shifts. So going in, in Ding's opening speech, just to hold that particular leader to account. He made a reference to the clean, efficient, and low carbon use of traditional fossil fuels. That's kind of a rough estimation of the quote. Whereas later on in the negotiations, you saw a lot more emphasis on this idea of tripling renewable energy, particularly in a way that displaces fossil fuels. You see a little shift in the narrative there. And quite interestingly as well, that's where the pre-COP dances and negotiations that were happening even before all of these dignitaries flew in on the 30th of November really show their importance. So back in mid-November, you had the Sunnyland Statement, which was part of this kind of ramping up of, or rather the warming up of this relationship between the US and China. So over the last year, you've had a lot more interaction between high-level ministers in the US and China than you have in years prior. And that culminated in, first of all, the Sunnyland Statement, which was hammered out between climate envoys Kerry and Xia, and then later your summit between President Xi and President Biden. And what you're now seeing is that the language and the, I hesitate to use the word compromises, but the positions that the US and China settled on in their Sunnyland Statement, then being reflected in negotiations in the kind of end game of COP. So one of the processes that you mentioned is the loss and damage fund. And that was a, a really big kind of point of discussion at the previous COP. And also in the run up to this one, there was a lot of discussion around how that fund should be managed. And then somewhat to my surprise, like a little bit less conversation around that, you know, kind of as COP went on. So I was wondering, you know, kind of where you see loss and damage standing now, like what has been agreed and what are still some of the sticking points that are going forward? Absolutely. And I think loss and damage is definitely one of those things. When I started really focusing on 
COP and climate policy. It's one of those things that really took my while to get my head around. I think with loss and damage, it almost depends who you ask, but I think that it's largely seen as one of the big successes of this COP in a way. So as you said, Cobus, a lot of the wrangling, the diplomatic wrangling around loss and damage fund happened last year. And then you have between COP27 and COP28, you've had a lot of you know, smaller, less blitzy negotiations just happening on, you know, how do we operationalize this thing? Who's running it? Who's contributing to it? What are the kind of nuts and bolts and all the fun legalese that goes into this? And so when you had the opening ceremony and COP President Al Jabba banging his gavel right at the opening of COP and this kind of very long meeting where he raises an agenda item and then you wait to see if anyone's going to raise an objection or not. The fact that there was an agenda item that called for the operationalization of COP and you didn't have any countries immediately disagreeing to that was actually quite a big moment. It, it's quite a geeky thing to be pleased that an agenda item gets through, but that was the signal that there's a lot of support for operationalization of this COP and that we can really move on with the nuts and bolts. So I think that, yeah, for a lot of the onlookers, that was a real high moment at the beginning of COP. And then now it kind of, you do fall a little bit more into the weeds. So for obviously me as a China analyst at Carbon Brief, the big question is what is China going to do about loss and damage? And frankly, at this COP, the answer is not that much. It Which is, was the same answer as the last COP, by the way. They've been pretty upfront saying they're not going to pay for loss and damage. I mean, there's been no vagaries on that. They have. And I think just speaking to people who have looked at this a lot longer than I have, there's a little bit more nuance around that. So again, this goes back to the Sunnyland statement where reporting has said that loss and damage was one of the topics discussed. I think the idea of whether you're a developing nation or a developed nation has a lot of political ramifications beyond the COP. It, it affects your trade policy. It, it affects, you know, how... Uh, political kind of political status within various multilateral organizations. So I don't think that anyone should expect China to jump up tomorrow and say, actually, we're a developed nation now and we're going to feed into loss and damage. What is quite interesting and what I've heard is that, especially through the Sunnyland statement, instead there was an agreement that First of all, China might not draw from the loss and damage fund in the first instance. That might not be something where if, you know, there's another flood in Honan or drought or heavy snows in the north, they might not immediately turn to the loss and damage fund. We'll have to wait and see if that's the case or not. And the other agreement that was made is that while China might not contribute to the loss and damage fund in the way that the UAE has as a country that we also often consider a developing country, it might contribute through other South-South funds. It might contribute through, uh, I've already forgotten the name, but there's a Africa Climate Summit where China's made commitments in the past and there's this understanding that they'll continue to contribute what we can consider loss and damage funding through other mechanisms. But actually, it was quite interesting. I was talking to Chinese NGO leaders and, and members of various think tanks. And I think there is this question of, on a, again, on a per capita basis, how do you rank China? Obviously, it's the second largest economy. It might soon be the first largest economy. But when you have countries like the UAE, where on a per capita basis, they are richer than the average Chinese citizen. It then comes down to this philosophical question of, you know, is that A, is that the metric that we should be using? And then also the more practical question of, you know, how do we sell this to citizens back home who are currently going through quite a lot of economic hardship or rather they're feeling that kind of economic pinch right now? How do we then tell them, oh, and we've contributed billions of dollars to this fund? So again, it's kind of this question of, from the outside, we might have this perspective. But for me, it was definitely interesting hearing non-government participants in the COP also raising these alternative perspectives. Yeah, it's really a dilemma for the Chinese because if they do agree to join loss and damage, then it does undermine their narrative 
as being a victim of climate change, not a perpetrator of it. And also, it removes them from being a developing country into a more advanced country, which is, again, not what they want to position themselves as. There's a movement now to really position China as a leader of the global south, competing in some ways for India for that mantle. It's a ridiculous notion. There is no leader of the global south. It's too varied a coalition. But these are about narratives and ideologies And also at the same time, I think it plays into the great power competition a little bit because the United States really wants China to contribute to loss and damage. And it could be seen that they are making a concession to the United States and to the Europeans, which they don't feel they should. But I think it's interesting what you're talking about, how they may kind of deflect off of loss and damage, but yet contribute to any number of other funds to support those. But it really raises this question about China, because if you look at the statistics Again, everything with China is enormous. That's by definition what it is. But when you look at the addition of 70 plus gigawatts of new coal power added in China over the past 10 years, it's really hard to kind of stomach that given the fact that, sure, they have a right to heat and to power their people. Climate change has wreaked havoc on river in terms of drought and the amount of water in the rivers that's powering hydroelectric dams, which prompted whole bunches of blackouts last year throughout the Southwest, around Chongqing and Sichuan. But when there's so much coming out of China on the scale that it's coming out in terms of coal-based emissions, how do you not think of China as one of the main perpetrators of climate change today? Never mind the history of the past hundred years, but today where we are. Did you get any feedback from the Chinese about their current reliance on coal and their reliance on fossil fuels? Oh, absolutely. And I think that is a very fair narrative. I think I'm going to have to go into the weeds a little bit on China's energy policy. So apologies to apologies. Yeah, to all please. No, no, that. go ahead. Let's do this. But really, so the big thing is energy security, right? So there's obviously this question of what do we think that President Xi's actual political priorities and opinions are? And as outsiders, I think that's something that we're never really going to fully know, right? But for me, I'm a little bit of an optimist for two reasons. First of all, as someone who's not normally an optimist when it comes to Chinese politics, um, first of all, you know, she made a very upfront pledge that China is going to try to get to carbon neutrality. So that's one very big indicator of how he feels about climate change and environmental policy, right? And the other is, if you look at his time back when he was a provincial leader in Zhejiang, I believe. He was almost a first mover on environmental policy. So I just kind of want to set that as a baseline for, you know, I'm not sure I always buy into the narrative of all of China's climate pledges are a bit of a smokescreen for unabashed, unabated use of fossil fuels. I think that what happened is that in 2020... No, no, sorry to interrupt you. Just to build on that point, And just so I don't want people to think that we're necessarily bashing on China, but China is at the same time a leader in clean energy, in clean mobility, green mobility. And so it is this contradiction where it is both a major polluter, but also a major innovator as well at the same time. Both things are true. No, that's exactly the point. And I think that when you're dealing with China and climate, you do have to hold those two thoughts in your head at once, which I think people in politics in both China and in Western countries, uh, that might be a thought they're a bit allergic to. I think, to cut a very long story short, in 2021, you had these shortages of clean energy, of hydropower specifically, and then issues with renewable energy that meant that you saw massive power shortages in major cities and major economic hubs. And frankly, I think that that maybe not frightened, but definitely shocked Chinese leadership. And you suddenly have this resurgence of, we're coming out of COVID, we have a very bad economic situation right now, we can't really afford to be losing power. So that's when you really start seeing this ramp up of coal. I can't claim any credit for this, but we had some excellent analysis by a guy called Larry Milaverta, who's looked at the data on China's air pollution on Chinese um, China's energy transition for a very long time, who has said that in theory, because of all of this renewable power that's getting added, you know, in, in the hundreds of gigawatts, thousands of gigawatts, you're in theory, China could start peaking coal emissions. 
But because you're getting this ramp up of coal power, because the government wants to avoid another shortage of power if renewables suddenly fail, the key question is, you know, you can have all of this capacity, but are you going to use it? So if China ramps up all of this coal power, but doesn't use it and only uses it if they see, you know, another one of these catastrophic droughts, then you could start seeing a structural decline in China's carbon emissions as early as next year. If they keep building this coal power and using this coal power, then you have a problem and then you have to take China to task. So I think to go back to the question that you asked, I'm sure a very long time ago, the people that I was speaking to were saying, well, look, this is backup. This is something that frankly, China's now instituting mechanisms to pay coal power plant owners to not produce coal power. So you need to trust us that this is just a backup. Whereas, you know, people on the other side of the table are saying, well, that's all well and good, but you're building this capacity. And, you know, we have to, in a way, take the worst case scenario. If you do use this, then that 1.5 degrees target is even further away than it was before 2021. Does that answer the question? It does. And Cobus, when you hear all of this that Annika is talking about in terms of, you know, splicing the details and the complexity of it, somebody who has been a critic of industrial countries and their climate policies, what do you think? Well, this is the process I have to go through to move toward some kind of more conclusive kind of phase out, you know, our fossil fuels more broadly. This is a kind of a necessary part of that process. And one of the things that has been very interesting is the role of just simply the the huge amount of renewables that China produces and how that is starting to shift decisions you know, in other countries as well. So for example, in South Africa, over the last six months or so, the first six months of this year, actually, South Africans have imported huge amounts of Chinese made solar simply as a response to a homegrown electricity crisis. So, you know, South Africans, and this isn't, you know, through any Belt and Road initiative, or even through work by the South African government, but these are simply middle class South Africans importing about the equivalent of about 5% of South Africa's installed capacity, just in the first six months, you know, just in the form of of solar panels from China. You know, so it's as these industries mature, they start taking on a kind of a critical mass of their own. But, you know, kind of working out, obviously, how, you know, kind of what the percentages are is extremely tricky. Annika, as part of this process, they've been going through what they call a global stock take in this year's COP process. I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about what that is and like what China's position in it is. Absolutely. So the global stock take is a mechanism that was agreed on previous COPs to essentially, once you have the Paris Agreement, to take a step back and see, okay, how well are we actually doing for every country to look at its NDCs, which are the kind of the blueprints that that each country put out to say, this is how we're going to meet the Paris Agreement. And it's a way for countries as a whole to come together and judge which countries are pulling their weight, frankly, which ones aren't. I think the answer is, as we've all seen, that most countries are falling behind. And then, as it says in the name, taking stock and then figuring out the path forward. So obviously, some of the key questions around that are about fossil fuels, are about tripling renewable energy, as well as how much should we be focusing on mitigating carbon emissions, that is, cutting off the trajectory and and kind of lowering output of carbon and and possibly even pulling carbon back from the atmosphere if we can get those technologies figured out, as opposed to adapting to climate change. And as we've just been speaking about, putting money into loss and damage funds, helping especially global South countries develop infrastructure that's more resilient to climate change and making sure that those mechanisms are there if we do start seeing more and more extreme weather as a result of missing this 1.5 target. Just want to start wrapping up and get your reflections on whether or not you think COP is a productive forum. Some people say, listen, just having the place to get together to talk is important because the other venues don't really work. I personally find that so much of the discussion at COPs by the various countries is disconnected from the politics back home. That is, to see some of the Nigerian rhetoric coming out, they're talking about, you know, phasing out oil. There's no way the Nigerians are going to phase out oil. That's their main revenue generator. And to hear the Americans talk, I mean, you know that the leading candidate for the presidency of the United States, Donald Trump, 
told Sean Hannity that on the first day he's going to be a dictator, and he said two things he was going to do. He was going to fence up the border, and he was going to drill, drill, drill. Okay? You don't hear that perspective amplified at COP. Yurtz Wilder, the, the Dutch leader who won, completely threw out so much of the environmental agenda. And so I find there's this disconnect between all the happy talk at COP among climate supporters or climate enthusiasts, climate activists, whatever you want to call it, and the populist reactionary politics in many of the polluting countries. Same with the Japanese. Kobus, you and I have talked about for a long time. When they phased out their nuclear program, what did they do? They went to oil and coal. Germany, same thing. They lost the Russian gas. They went to coal. So the politics at home are immediate, and coal and fossil fuels satisfy that immediate need. And then they have this talk at COP, which is all about, yes, we're going to do this, we're going to do that, we'll agree to that, we're going to pay this. And it's totally disconnected from any reality, politically. Am I being too cynical? Or is there something that I'm missing here? No, as a fellow cynic, I think that that is a valid point. I would say, though, that, you know, we're looking at a situation where I think we have a 14% chance of hitting... 1.5C, as you mentioned in the opening to this podcast, you have the leader of OPEC sending around letters that are calling for fossil fuels to remain a hardwired part of our energy landscape, right? It's something that I personally find very difficult to swallow, given that we started talking about climate change when I was still in school. It's been part of my education that this is a major crisis. And I think that it's very fair to say that on a domestic point, we do tend to sacrifice climate policy sometimes for economic policy or, or for, for more short-term goals. What I would say the value of COP is, is that I think it's threefold. First of all, you have this big showpiece event once a year that countries almost have to respond to. If I think any country, whether it's the political system in the UK or whether it's the political system in China, you do see people saying, you know, what is happening at COP? What are we doing about it? And so there is a pressure on the political class to at least put something together. Now, whether that's symbolism or whether that's substance is obviously going to vary, but you know, it forces climate back onto the agenda once a year in a way that we might not have in such a tangible way without this big set piece circus almost. I think the second benefit is that I'm not sure that you'd have the relationship between the US and China on climate that we do without these cops. So being able to say, well, look, you agreed to 1.5 in Paris, whether we have big joint statement as we had in Glasgow and as we had with the Sunnyland Summit, or whether you just have these meetings between task force who meet once a year at COP, who then are ticking over to, to show their bosses that they're making progress throughout the rest of the year. I think that that leads to alignment on issues that we wouldn't have without a COP. So you might then have to bring a concrete example and maybe go on a tangent as we're wrapping up to you have methane, which wasn't necessarily an issue, you know, at Copenhagen, at Paris, but now is on the table and is on the table because of this US-China engagement that happened because of the cops. And then thirdly, for me, something that I didn't expect to be happening on the scale that it was happening is also the kind of civil society action that you see going around the cop. So forget about you know, all of these climate envoys and presidents and, and vice premiers, you also just have forums for academics to connect, for protesters to be talking about, you know, both climate issues and non-climate issues. You're at networking events or, or dinners or drinks where you're just meeting with people whose perspectives you wouldn't have. I was talking to a lady who was looking at ecofeminism and human rights in Tunisia. And that's not necessarily something that would ever come across my beat on my day job. So I would say that you're absolutely right that, you know, we do need a way for outcomes at COP to translate into binding legal mechanisms in the UK or in China or in South Africa or wherever it may be. But my point of view is that it's always good to have engagement and it's always good to have things that keep these issues on the top of the agenda. So in looking at China's role in all of this, it seems to me that just taking in mind China's strategic 
preoccupations and worries, particularly around energy access and energy security and the huge amount of work that China puts into ensuring energy security in all fields. It seems to me, just as a you know, kind of as a layperson, kind of outside of that conversation, that renewables and China's massive lead in renewables seems like a strategic win-win for them. You know, that they would be able to ensure a lot of domestic energy security simply through renewables and that they'd also be able to just export huge amounts of renewables, for, you know, and, and make just make a lot of money out of that. But at the same time, we also know, as you've been pointing out, that a lot of work goes into, for example, ensuring China's access to oil. So do you see a kind of a tipping point coming or like a, an inflection point coming in, in, in the future when, when where China's energy security is going to be conclusively much more about renewables than hydrocarbons? Like roughly where do you think that kind of switch lies? Frankly, I've asked that question myself to a lot of people at COP, and I think that there are a few too many variables to have an exact date. I think that that's dependent, first of all, on just technologies. So really, you're looking at either hydrocarbons plus carbon capture, utilization and storage, CCUS, or you're looking at renewables with some form of baseline, whether that's hydrogen, and that would have to be green hydrogen, which for listeners is hydrogen that's made using renewable energy rather than using coal-based energy that's then either you use CCUS to capture that coal or you don't. So it either has to be green hydrogen or it has to be battery storage. So you have your solar panel, right? And it's collecting energy during the day. And then at night, that energy is then stored in, in batteries or same with wind. When the wind's blowing, it collects energy, stores it in a battery for use when the wind's not blowing. The problem is on all of those fronts that the technology just isn't there yet. So CCUS, we've been talking about that for a decade plus, and it's still not scalable. Batteries are a bit more interesting, but it's still quite a new technology. Hydrogen, there are very, very few projects out there, and those that are are still quite small scale. So it's a little bit of a guessing game as to when those will scale up to the point that renewables are going to be that reliable option, unfortunately going to end a little bit on a down note, even though there was a little bit of optimism in your comments. So our skepticism, our joint skepticism and cynicism was mitigated a little bit today in our conversation, Annika. So thank you so much for your insights and for taking the time. It was great to speak with you, someone who was actually there at the pavilion talking with the Chinese and better understanding what was going on at COP. If people want to follow what you are reading and writing, you are active on X. Where can they find you? So my handle is underscore A-N underscore Patel. I would also encourage everyone to go to carbonbrief.org and sign up to our newsletters. We have a China newsletter that goes out every other week. And we have some really great reporting going on there, not just about China, but also about broader policy and science topics. Eric and Kobus, thank you again so much. Yes, thank you. And we'll put a link to the China newsletter on Carbon Brief and Carbon Brief. In the show notes, Annika Patel is a China analyst at Carbon Brief, a site focused on global climate issues. Annika was there at COP, so I really recommend that you follow her X handle as well for all of the great articles that she is sharing. Annika, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. Thank you both. Great chatting to you. Kobus, I'm not sure whether to feel more optimistic or more depressed about where we are as a species in terms of our capacity to combat climate change and to mitigate the effects of all the pollution that we continue to pump out into the world. And so some of the things Annika said were very encouraging, the fact that there is this discussion between John Kerry and Xie Jianhua. At the same time, it's a little bit discouraging that the Chinese are still being very opaque with their process. I guess we shouldn't be surprised about that, that they seem to want to have it both ways, where they don't want to take a strong position, because if they take a strong position on things like loss and damage or on any of the other issues, then it might compromise other parts of their agenda in politics, in development, and elsewhere. That being said, the most important thing to remember about with China is they're both a villain and a victim at the same time, because you've pointed out many, many times that if we look at just the past three to five years of who are the largest emitters and don't pay attention to the historical context of how we got here, then that's disingenuous. And that's what the Chinese always want to remind us. 
that yes, today they are the largest emitter on a national basis, but for 100 years it was the West as they industrialized. And that's honestly the take that we get here in Vietnam, which is, you know, we're industrializing now and now you want to cut our legs off. That's not fair. Now, Vietnam is taking a very interesting approach to all of this because they too are ramping up the green energy production, but coal remains a huge problem. Our AQI today, that's the air quality index, was north of 160. And a lot of that is from coal because the winds change in the wintertime and so the pollution blows inland. So the pollution goes up a lot in the wintertime. And when you talk to climate experts, they say it's the coal burning that's happening here. So we still have a long way to go. And I just really wonder if we have time. That's, you know, Mother Nature has her own plan. Yeah, we clearly don't have time. You know, kind of that <laughs> that is one of the big problems. But China's position in all of this is very interesting for me because one of the big problems that it points out is not only that Western countries had this hundred years of polluting, which they used to build their economies, and now they're forcing other economies to move over to other technologies. I mean, that's already a big problem. But the additional problem is that for most of those hundred years, the very idea idea of what it meant to be modern or what it meant to be industrialized, what modern life needed was defined by Western development. You know, so that includes having to have cars, having to have highways, having to thinking of like the very thinking about how to use natural resources down all the way to needing plastic bags, for example. All of those were templates set by Western development. Those have all now been unmasked as massive failures. You know, they were economic successes, but they were huge failures in all respects. So, and, and these weren't only, you know, kind of the failures of the particular kind of emissions regimes, they were the very failures of modernity itself, right? So China's now stepping into a space where there's a whole set of Chinese, you know, rhetoric around alternative forms of modernization, Chinese models of modernization. Like, that's one of the things that China leans into the most, right? It's like everywhere they go, like the Chinese are always like, oh, you don't have to have this kind of destructive West and colonialism-based form of modernization take and look at ours instead so great problem is the vast bulk of china's modern modernization followed the same trajectory as western modernization only you know more efficiently faster but not fundamentally different you know it's still like taking western templates of modernization and, and putting a chinese spin on them whether china's will be able to turn the corner on that and that by that you know isn't china alone but also all of these other emerging global south powers none of them have stepped up and really provided any kind of like alternative model right kind of they all still not 19th century models they're all basically like the western countries are, are largely still you know so dependent on 19th century models and with them all of these other emulators of western development as well the one country that's different you know that i can point to immediately is kenya for example that does have significantly different energy model but kenya is very rare and it's also dependent on geographically specific factors yeah i mean kenya's blessed with uh, thermal energy from the ground so that's not really a fair example there exactly it, it sits on the rift valley so it has access to it in a way that other countries don't but yeah well you know <laughs> If only we had a fair example, that would be a great luxury. So even Japan that sits on more kind of geothermal potential than any other place in the world is still nuclear and coal based. So in that sense, like we're at a massive kind of philosophical inflection point, which is roughly the very idea of the future has to be rethought. And the very idea of modernity has to be rethought. And China is to a certain extent a very big player in that field, but in other ways, not at all, right? Kind of they haven't kind of stepped up in doing the kind of thought leadership that they should have done. And we'll see whether they're, they're able to, or they or anyone is able to. That is a problem. It's like at the moment of like massive failure of imagination. And yet, when China is talking to African countries about the example that it can set for African countries, what we're hearing now more and more is that we're going to help you industrialize. And so this is going to be a major theme at the 2024 FOCAC, the Forum on China-Africa Cooperation gathering that's going to happen in next year, is all about African industrialization. That's been the talk that's come out of China for the past year now. Since the Belt and Road financing has kind of cratered in Africa, they're saying, okay, we're going to bring our private industry, we're going to teach how to build a manufacturing sector, and the word industrialization is used by both Africans and Chinese for what they want for their future. I mean, there we go. 
Yeah. And, you know, to be fair, as countries in the world go, there's very few of them that can make a similar claim as China has. Because, you know, if, we, if we're looking simply at solar alone, even now, in these early days, solar already makes up 7% of China's total, you know, trade deficit with the rest of the world. The top 10 companies in the world making, you know, kind of solar leaders in the world are all Chinese. China's put in 10 times as much investment into solar as, as the whole of Europe. So, you know, kind of like... If, if you're going to be looking at a, at some kind of country to provide this leadership, there's very few of them that can make that claim as China can. But but I'm talking about industrialization here. And industrialization is inherently bad for the environment. If we're going to start building factories in Africa, the same way that China built factories in its own country, and look what it did to its air, land, and water. It trashed it. Well, that's the thing, is that the industrialization that China has achieved has been on a Western model, which is why its environment is wrecked, right? And the, like, but what do you think they're going to bring over to Africa then? Well, that's the point, is that no one has really done green industrialization yet. Like, of the kind of very weak candidates out there, China's probably the strongest, but no one has done it yet. Kind of, we're really in, in the kind of like uncharted territory in terms of like what actual green industrialization will look like, even though everyone is throwing around the concept. So it's, you know, like, let's see. I mean, you know, kind of like, you know, don't disappoint us, everyone, you know, but who knows? The problem in many African countries, though, in many countries around the world, including where I live here in Vietnam as well, is governance. And so if it is two cents to manufacture the widget with oil and gas, and it's four cents to do it with green energy, which it always isn't that way necessarily, but oftentimes it is cheaper use coal or fossil fuels, then people are going to go with the cheaper cost. Because the capitalist system demands that, right? Well, this is why carbon pricing is so important. And this is, again, why we're a cop, right? Kind of like because all of these systems, these global pricing systems have to be worked out. Is Nigeria going to enforce that? I mean, do you really expect that to happen in Nigeria? Well, that's a good question. Let's see, you know. Well, the Europeans are bringing in the CBAM system soon, right? Kind of so they will have our first test case. What's the CBAM system? It's the Carbon Border Adjustment Mechanism System. It's, it's essentially like making countries with cheaper carbon prices than the EU pay the shortfall through their imports. Highly controversial in Africa. Like a lot of African countries don't like this concept at all. We'll see whether Europeans bring it in actually. But, you know, kind of that will be the first really kind of comprehensive like test, I think, of like whether it's possible to make carbon pricing work and where the global south is going to shake out on it. And, you know, kind of it's, it's going to be very, I think, possibly painful and destructive for many African countries, and we'll have to see whether it works at all. Well, we have tons of climate coverage over on our website at chinaglobalsouth.com. We've been covering this from the energy side, from the renewables, as well as a lot of the battery metals that are going into power, electric vehicles and electronics around the world. We've got data sets. We've got so much information. So if you are interested in what China is doing, not only in Africa, but in Asia, the Middle East, and elsewhere around the Global South, go to ChinaGlobalSouth.com. You'll find it all there. We've got some great search tools that are there. We also have a ChatGPT-powered chatbot that is a closed network generative AI that you can use to start asking some questions about it. And so it's fantastic. And we've just launched a new video service that we're starting to ramp up more and more. So you're going to see Cobus and the rest of the team start giving their analysis in video as well on the site. And then next year, in January, we're going to be launching a brand new research hub where we're going to have our data sets and all of the analysis around nickel, cobalt, solar power, all these different things are going to be available. So some very exciting things are happening, particularly in the climate space here at the China Global South Project. If you would like to get access to all of the information and to support the work of independent journalists that we're doing, uh, go to chinaglobalsouth.com slash subscribe. We'll give you a free trial for 30 days. And also, we've got discounts half off for students and teachers. So uh, send me an email, eric, E-R-I-C, at chinaglobalsouth.com. And before we go, a huge shout out to our Patreon supporters. Thank you. We really could not do this work without you. We are so grateful for your support. Patreon.com slash chinaglobalsouth. So many of our Patreon supporters just want to support us and the work that we're doing because they believe 
in independent journalism and media that, again, we don't have any allegiances other than to give you guys good information. So thank you to our Patreon supporters. That'll do it for this edition of the China Global South podcast. Copus and I will be back again next week for another edition of the show. If you're interested in Africa-related issues specifically, make sure you subscribe to our Friday editions as well. And those of you getting our Africa podcast, you get all of the shows in the same feed. So Copus and I will be back again next week with another episode. Until then, thank you so much for listening. The discussion continues online. Follow the China Global South Project on Twitter at China GS Project and share your thoughts on today's show or head over to our website at ChinaGlobalSouth.com where you can subscribe to receive full access to more than 5,000 articles and podcasts. Once again, that's ChinaGlobalSouth.com.